ABC Kindred Teeth presents An Outlaw Thanksgiving, written by Emily Arnold McCulley. The Chicago and Rock Island Express roared into Omaha, Nebraska one November day in 1896, and roared into just means it came in at a fast speed. Clara Mayer was the first off, eager, really wanting, for a gulp, or a mouthful, of fresh air after two days in the sooty, or black from smoke, rail car. Clara and her mother had come halfway on a journey, or a trip, that had begun in New York State. The day after tomorrow, they would meet Papa in Utah and go on to a new life in California, her mother hurried into the station to freshen up or clean up a bit. Clara set off to explore. Keep your eyes peeled, coming west, Papa had written. Out here, you never know what will happen next. Keeping your eyes peeled just means that you're watching what's going on around you. She heard a hubbub, a lot of noise from a crowd, of strange languages and accents, emigrants, people leaving their country to live in another one, and roughnecks, people who work at hard jobs, rubbed elbows with travelers in fine clothing. Clara spotted a poster on one wall. Pinkerton's National Detective Agency wanted $4,000 reward for train robbery, cattle rustling or stealing cows, bank robbery, Robert Leroy Parker, alias Butch Cassidy. I'd sure like to meet him, said a voice. Clara turned in surprise to find the newsboy from the train. So there's Clara and there's the newsboy. Butch Cassidy? But he's an outlaw, she said. No worse than the robber barons, the people who have gotten rich by taking advantage of others, who run these railways, the boy replied with a grin. Anyway, I think I'd like Butch Cassidy. They say he's awfully good-hearted, nice to other people, gives some of what he steals to needy folks, never killed nobody either. Well, the Pinkertons are after him, Clara said. Butch ain't afraid of the law or anything else, the boy said. Clara wanted to hear more, but Mama had found her. Clara, you worry me so. She glanced at the poster and shuddered, shook with fear or disgust. It's time to transfer, switched to another train, to the Union Pacific train, she went on. I've bought some sandwiches for our supper. The prairie, a lot of mostly flat land with few trees, outside Omaha was as vast, very big, as an ocean. Clara stared at it in awe or amazement. To stretch her legs, she made her way to the water cooler. Other people drank from the cup the railroad put out, but Mama insisted Clara use the cup she'd brought along. Mama worried about germs, strangers, and train wrecks. It sounds like the mom worries about a lot of things. Lamps came on and the sun sank below the endless horizon. That's the line where the land meets the sky. People took out their picnic suppers. A few played cards. Clara and Mama wrapped up in their pillows and blankets. They drifted off to sleep to the clackety-clack of the wheels. In the morning, everything was white. Snow fell in thick, churning, twisting and coming down fast. Flakes snowed nearly all night. The conductor said, we've lost some time. Mama fretted, or worried, over the news. Across from them, a man was playing a card game. He looked over and said, Hope they make it up. I've got a big Thanksgiving dinner to get to. 
will be with Papa on Thanksgiving Day, said Clara. We haven't seen him for months. He went to California to start his new business. The man tipped his hat to Mama. Clara, we don't know him, her mother whispered, but Clara thought she'd made a friend. He told her his name was Mr. Jones. In the afternoon, the train lost speed as if exhausted or very tired. Finally, with a shudder or a shake, it stopped. The conductor, the person working on the train who takes care of the riders, hurried past. We're snowbound, which means they're stuck in the deep snow, he announced. Big drifts blocking us. We'll send for a plow as soon as it stops snowing. Mercy, Clara's mother said. My husband expects us in Ogden tomorrow. You won't make it, said Mr. Jones. Mama clutched, or held tightly, Clara's hand. Don't worry, Papa will wait for us, Clara assured her. They sat in the car all day long, huddling in their blankets, trying to make their food last. The snow stopped the next morning, but the car was bitterly cold, or very cold. Through the frosted window, Clara could see mountains ahead. We'd better get moving soon, a well-dressed passenger remarked. If one of those train robbers took a fancy to us, we'd be sitting ducks. Mama gasped like, <gasps> They heard bells jangling. A sleigh drew alongside the train. All aboard for the hotel and saloon. Rest in peace. Rock Springs, the driver hollered. Another sleigh arrived. Jump on for the Dusty Dude Hotel and Dance Hall, Green River. Wait for the train in the lap of luxury, a very fancy place. Mama, let's go to a hotel, Clara cried. People were streaming from the train to board the sleighs. Goodness, no, Mama said. They'll have bed bugs and all sorts of riffraff people who behave badly. You've got to go, ma'am, or freeze to death, Mr. Jones said gently. A smaller sled had arrived. Where do you want to go? The driver hollered. Mr. Jones shouted, I'll give you fifty dollars to take me to Brown's Hole. Get in, cried the driver exuberantly which means with a lot of energy and excitement, Mr. Jones turned to Mama. Come with me to Brown's Hole, ma'am. It's just over the border in Utah. We're respectable ranchers down there. Respectable means that they can be trusted, and a rancher is usually someone with a farm that has lots of animals like cows or sheep. You'll get a real Thanksgiving dinner while you wait for the train to move. It'll be a few days before they can dig it out. Mama sighed. We haven't any choice. Thank you, Mr. Jones. It seemed they had traveled for hours when Mama called out, How much longer will it take us to get to Brown's Hole, Mr. Jones? His voice trailed back to them. A day and a half, I reckon, just in time for our dinner. Mama turned white with shock, which means her face lost its color because of the surprise. Even to Clara, snow stinging her cheeks, it seemed Mr. Jones had played a terrible joke on them, but there was no way out of it now. The runners, and that's what runners look like, hissed and scraped. After darkness fell, they found themselves in a cabin where a gruff, that's her, someone who's not very friendly, woman put them to bed. At dawn, she gave them coffee and biscuits before they set off again. At last, they emerged from, or came out of, a canyon into a wide valley. The sun warmed them as they pulled up to the log house where the dinner would be held. A man bounded out, or ran out. Oh, welcome to Brown's Hole, wayfarers. Wayfarers, someone who travels usually by walking. 
he said in a thick Scots brogue or an accent. I'm John Jarvey. Howdy Jones didn't think you'd make it. We were all snowballing on the train, Mr. Jones said. He introduced Mama and Clara to Jarvey, the local storekeeper. You're brave pilgrims, people who travel, Jarvey said to Mama. And you're just in time. Some of our old cow hands, people who take care of cows, are giving a banquet today for the residents of Brown's Hole. People streamed from the house, which means they came out one right after another, to see who had come. Let me introduce our hosts. People who are taking care of their guests, said Jarvie. Ladies, meet Bill, Les, Elsa, Isama, Bob, and Harry. Clara was startled, surprised. Sure, she had seen one of the men somewhere before. Bob bowed low and kissed Mama's hand. That brooch is most becoming, ma'am, he said. And a brooch or a brooch looks a bit like this. It's a piece of jewelry that you wear on your shirt or your jacket or your coat. And when they say it is becoming, it just means it's pretty. Such refined manners. And refined just means very good manners. Mama whispered to Clara, He looks familiar, doesn't he? I can't imagine where we could have met him. A woman in a silk dress swished up to them. I'm Ann Bassett. I'm famished, or very hungry. And I reckon you are too, she said, opening the door. Inside were long tables set with gleaming china, silver, and crystal. My, Mama exclaimed. While Elza passed the relish tray, and that's a plate with veggies and other snacks before the main meal, John Jarvey took up an accordion, which looks a bit like this. And you can see him playing it over here. He played, and the guests sang, Then You'll Remember Me. Ann Bassett delivered a short talk on the meeting of Thanksgiving. I coached her myself, Jarvey said. Bob and the other hosts retired to, or went into, the kitchen and could be seen scooping food onto platters or big plates. Their voices carried into the room. You carve less. Nah, let Elsa. Elsa's all thumbs. Well, do I start at the neck of the tail? Jarvie tapped his glass. Let us give thanks for our beloved Brown's Hole, for this magnificent feast, and for America, land of the free, he declared. Hear, hear, everyone called. Mr. Jones winked at Clara from across the table. She felt as if he had led them into a dream, strange and familiar at the same time. Clara ate everything. Oysters, which look like this. They come from clams. Cranberries, turkey with chestnuts, stuffing, mashed potatoes with giblet gravy, sweet potatoes, cabbage, beets, beans, creamed peas, celery, pickled walnuts, and sweet pickles, olives, fresh tomatoes on crisp lettuce, hot rolls, and sweet butter, cheese, pumpkin pie, plum pudding, mince, and salted nuts. It was the biggest and best meal she'd ever had. Wow, that is a lot of food. Bob bustled about, offering second helpings and thirds and even fourths. But when he came out with coffee, Esam yelled, Ain't you never served a formal meal before? You properly pour from the right. Well, you know how sorry my aim is, Esam, Bob answered. The important thing is to hit the cop. Etiquette, which means rules about how to behave, can put fear into the bravest man's heart, said Miss Bassett. Mama laughed with the rest, but Clara, staring at Bob, heard a sudden echo. He ain't afraid of the law or anything else. 
that face on the poster, Robert Leroy Parker, Bob was Butch Casty, and his friends, they must be outlaws too. She glanced at Mama, who seemed to have forgotten all her worries. Clara must keep her from finding out they'd been led to a den of thieves. Poor Mama, she'd faint dead away if she knew. John Jarvey got out his fiddle and struck up turkey in the straw. People danced. Clara watched to see who Bob, Butch, would choose for a partner. He came straight for her. He bowed. May I have this dance? He asked. Clara stared at him. His blue eyes twinkled. She had to be brave for Mama's sake. Mr. Cassidy, are you going to rob our train? She blurted, said without thinking about. Butch roared with laughter. I saw right away that you were sharp, he said. How did you know who I was? I saw your picture on a poster, Clara said. Well, a poster don't tell the whole story of a man, Butch said. We've all worked as cowhands here. These people have been good to us, and we're just saying thanks today, he winked. We won't rob your train. I wouldn't want to scare your mama after she's had such a nice time. They danced a polka, whirling around the room until Clara was dizzy. The dancing lasted all night. At the end of the party, Butch Casty took Clara's hand and closed it around a brand new silver dollar. Take this to remember the great Thanksgiving banquet at Brown's Hole, he said. The dollar was warm in her fist. She wondered how he'd gotten it. Thank you, she said. I'll never spend it. Clara and Mama stayed with John Jarvey's family. Two days later, a messenger arrived with word that the track had been cleared. Jarvey's mail sled took them back to the train. When they finally saw Papa, they poured out the story of their unexpected Thanksgiving feast. Everyone made us so welcome, Mama told him. I'm sure they did, Papa said. People are like that out here. Well, I miss Thanksgiving, but I'm mighty thankful we're safely together. So am I, Clara said. Should she tell Papa they'd been guests of Butch Casty and a gang of outlaws, she wondered. I'll tell him when we get to California, she decided, and I'll keep my eyes peeled the rest of the way west. Out here, you never know what will happen next. This is the route that they took from Omaha all the way to eventually to California. Author's Note By 1896, the United States was on the verge of the golden age of railroads, where railroads were very popular. Trains with opulent Pullman dining and parlor cars crossed the country though most people could only afford to travel in the coach cars. While much faster than any other means of transportation, rail travel still wasn't safe. Air brakes were new. Time zones had been instituted a decade earlier, making synchronization possible and avoiding head-on collisions. But owners charged whatever the traffic would bear and put safety far below profits. Snow was a problem for six or seven months of the year on the prairie. Passengers could perish in a blizzard. Snowbucker plows rammed into drifts at 65 miles per hour. Some disappeared into the drifts and stalled, trapping the crews. In the 1880s, a Canadian invented the rotary plow, which chewed up the snow and threw it aside at a stately pace of six miles per hour. Clara's train might have had to wait quite a while for one to be available. 